Hi everyone, thanks for listening to all my presentations. Today I'll be talking about the tiresome. The tiresome could be under different trade names. Could be Cardizem, Cardizem CD, Cardizem LA, Cartier XT, Zilt Exile, AAO Details, ACT Detailsem, Apple Details SR, and so on. Detailsem belongs to the class of medications known as calcium channel blockers. There are two blood groups under calcium channel blockers, is either dihydropyridine or non-dihydropyridine. Specifically, the tiazem is a member of non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. The other example in this group is verapamine, and I have a full presentation on verapamine already published. You can check my channel for that. Still on the classification, the tiazem is a class 4 antiarrhythmic agent. It's also known as an anti angina and anti abtensive agent. Uses The tiazem will be very useful in handling blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, cocaine induced chest pain, angina pectoris supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular arrhythmias, vasospastic angina, cluster headache prevention, migraine prophylaxis, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Actually, majority of doctors will not prescribe detazem for the purpose of abstention, but while using detazem, we should have it at the back of our mind that it could reduce the blood pressure. Forms. The tarzan could come under various forms like capsule, extended release, or 12 hour per hour as hydrochloride. In that case, we are going to find generic at 60 mg or 90 mg or 120 mg. And could also be in form of capsule, extended release, but this time uh, for 24 hour per hour. And in that case, we are going to find a lot of examples like calcium with 120, 180, 240, 300, or 360 milligram. It could be cardiac XT at 120, 180, 240, or 300 milligram. Or the exile at 120, 180, or 240 milligram. It could be the CD at 120 milligram or 180 milligram. It could be TRXT at 120, 180, 240, 300, or 360 milligram. And the standard release for 24 hours could also be TAZAC or TADID extended release at 360 or 420 milligram. And the extended release 24 hour per hour could be generic at 120, 180, 240, 300, 360, or 420 milligram. Still under forms, it could come in form of solution for intravenous root. And in that case, we're gonna find a generic at five milligram per mil. It could come in form of tablet per hour, and we might find generic at 30 milligram or 60 milligram. Could be tablet, you now the standard release tablet for 24 hour per hour, and we could see Telzac XC at 120 or 360 milligram, and maybe 180 per 24 hours or 240 per 24 hours or 300 milligram per 24 hours. Administration. Immediate release. Detazem, example cardizem, could be administered before meals and bedtime. Might be swallowed whole, crushed, or chewed. But don't spill the non-scored tablets. If it is extended release, 
which means it's for long term or is long acting form. It must be swallowed whole and must be given at the same time every day. For example, if you have chosen to give it every morning, it must be given every morning, every day. But if you choose to give it every evening, you can give it every evening, every day. If you have to give Tiazak XC, please give that at the hour of sleep or at the bedtime. Still on administration, Cardizem CD, Cardizem LA, Cardia XT, and Mazem LA can be given on an empty stomach or could be given with food. If you are going to give the following, then the person must not show them. But the individual can open the following on apple sauce and give them with generous fluid, and that will include. Tastia XT and Tiazag. Intravenous bolus should be given over two to three minutes. Advanced cardiac life support program will suggest three minutes. And I think we should go for the latter. Infusion at five milligrams per hour could be increased PRN to maximum of 15 milligrams per hour. But you must get EKG and cardiac monitoring. No, around. Adverse reactions. The side effects of the Tazem are minor. Well, we compare that to Verapamine, and the Tazem has less effect on the heart rate. Verapamine is the choice in a rapid and dangerous arrhythmia like supraventricular tachycardia. So, with this, if we are down with options of choosing either the tazem or verapamine as non dihydropredinine calcium channel blockers, then we've known when verapamine will have upper hand and when the tazem will be the better option. Adverse reactions. You can check my channel for a full presentation on Verapami already published. There you are going to find a very long list of side effects you know, associated with Verapami. I will not waste your time going over that right now, but just briefly, we can find headache, constipation, gingiva, hyperplasia, AV blockage, hypotension, peripheral edema, claudication, myocardial infarction, syncope, fatigue, dizziness, bronchospasm, vertigo, seizures, and the list goes on. If you check my channel and you check the rapami, you will get the full list of the side effects there. In addition to all those side effects under the rapami, Anyone on the tarsum might come down with the following also, that is crystalluria, petechiae, nausea and vomiting, xerostomia, albuminuria, increased LDH, hyperuricemia, abnormal dreams, bronchitis, and acute generalized enzymatous postulosis. Drug drug interaction. Because the list is really long, and because I may not be able to predict precisely what medications you've been on, or you may not be on, or you intend to prescribe to your patient, and not different doctors, different specialties, you know, treating the same person at the same time, so I will not be able to exhaust that. So I will refer you to a pharmacist or the cardiologist in your jurisdiction or your clinical pharmacologist. But I will not forget to mention here that grapefruit, grapefruit may increase the serum concentration of the tarsum because it's going to inhibit the hepatic enzymes. In pregnancy, the tarsum is under category C, meaning you have to weigh the balance of the benefits and the disadvantage. Preferably, when a woman is pregnant, we should use the hydroperidine cousin channel blocker 
or abstention, like nifedipin. And if she's breastfeeding, please discontinue breastfeeding if you must use the tarzan. Monitoring. Just like we have under verapamine, we have to monitor the blood pressure, the heart rate, and of course, see EKG in anyone using the tarzan. In addition to that, we have the liver function test done, renal function test, and we we'll screen for diabetes and mellitus. Warnings. Not giving warning to anyone per se, but we just have to remind ourselves of certain precautionary measures to be taken when we are using Ditazem or we have prescribed Ditazem to anyone. Okay. Intravenous formulation of ditazem is among the list of drugs with heightened risk of causing significant patient harm when used in error. For example, in the course of this presentation, I have alluded to the fact that when we want to give it intravenously, we give very low dosage and we give it for a long time, like three minutes. So we have to adhere to that. If not, we are going to do more harm than good. We should cautiously transfer or convert from intravenous route to paroral route or vice versa. We must avoid intravenous route in children. And why that? There's that probability of cardiac arrest, bradycardia, and hypotensive reactions. In older children, we have to cautiously give the tarsum through intravenous route. And why that? there may be AV blockage. And it is very likely that we will not only have AV blockage, we may also have acystole. So we must take extra, extra caution. Still on warnings, we may be faced with bradycardia, hypotension, increased liver enzymes, including a rise in bilirubin. There may be syncope, secondary to hypertension. Don't use detazem in wolf parkinson white syndrome. And why that? Because we might be faced with anterior grade conduction down the accessory pathway, and that will lead to ventricular fibrillation. Still on warnings. When we are dealing with individuals with myasthenia gravis or Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we have to decrease the dosage. And why that? We might be dealing with decreased neuromuscular transmission probability here. There's likely going to be increased intracranial pressure. So, be extra careful in people with supratentorial tumors at the time of anesthesia. Negative anotropic effect will likely worsen left ventricular dysfunction. And because of that, we have to avoid all non diadropyridine cousin channel blockers in heart failure. We must be cautious in renal and hepatic impairment. Contraindication We must never give ritazem in anyone with hypersensitivity to ritazem or any components of its formulation. Anyone on beta blockers is disqualified from taking detarsum. Anyone with heart failure should not have detarsum. Anyone with decreased left ventricular ejection fraction must not take detarsum. And it will be suicidal if anyone with cardiogenic shock or bradycardia is taking detarsum. In case of sick sinus syndrome or wolf parkinson white syndrome, we must not give the tarsum. Second and third degree heart block without a functioning pacemaker has disqualified anyone from taking the tarsum. Examples. These will be examples of conditions where and when we can use the tarsum. In chronic stable angina, we can give the tarsum if beta blockers are contraindicated. 
In that case, we could give immediate release by oral detazem at 30 mg four times daily, and we can increase as needed every two days to about 60 or 90 mg four times daily. If we have chosen to go for the extended release, the 12 hour extended release could be given twice daily at 60 mg twice daily and we can increase as needed every choice to 120 or 180 mg twice daily. If we are going for the extended release 24 hour then we could give that once daily. An example could be 120 or 180 mg once daily and you can increase every two weeks to 240 or 360 milligram once daily. In this spastic angina, you can give the tazem alone or you can combine that with nitrous. And you may decide to choose immediate release the tazem and you give that twice daily or you may go for extended release and give it once daily, just like we found under the stable angina above. Another example is cocaine induced chest pain. There is a separate presentation on the use of beta blockers in cocaine induced chest pain, and I have vehemently spoken against the use of beta blockers in cocaine induced chest pain. It is favored that non dihydropredine calcium channel blockers could be used here. Example will include verapamine and now detazem. So in case of cocaine induced chest pain and detazem, we can give detazem intravenously bolus at 0.25 mg per kilogram over two to three minutes. Well, I will choose three minutes. The average dose here is 20 milligram. You may repeat the dosage after 15 minutes as may be required. Another example is in the case of atrial fibrillation or atrial froth, but before you no know, loading the individual with the tazem, we must have our EKG done and rule out wolf parkinson white syndrome. Once there's no wolf parkinson white syndrome, then we can give the tazem in neutral fibrillation or atrial froth intravenously at 0.25 mg per kilogram bolus, but slowly, over two to three minutes. The average dose will be 20 mg. Here we can have continuous infusion that will be in the range of 5 to 10 mg per hour. And of course, the EKG and cardiac monitoring must be on at the same time. With that, I've come to the end of this presentation as per DTASM. For you to enjoy DTASM in total, please kindly check my channel for the full presentation that I published on Verapamine. When you combine both Verapamine and DTASM, then you must have known all you need to know as per the use of non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker in handling some related health problems, particularly in cardiovascular nervous system. Thanks for listening to this very presentation. Remember to subscribe to my channel and remember to share. I appreciate it.